Good evening. Now, can my digital twin help me live a healthier life? What is a digital twin? So let's, let's cast our mind back a little bit to 1970 and the Apollo 13 mission. When we send, we as in the human race, send some astronauts 200,000 miles away from here, and there was a problem. The infamous Houston, we have a problem. The levels of carbon dioxide became dangerously high in the cabin. But NASA had produced a twin of the lunar spacecraft in Houston, and they had their engineers there trying to work out what can they do. So they had a period of time where they could use the only tools that was available in space, could come up with a solution, trial experimented, and when they got a solution, they were able to relay that to the astronauts, and they were able to come back to Earth you know, alive, which was great. That was an example of what maybe is more a analog twin, but it is nonetheless you know, a very good example of what a twin can be useful for. Then, 30 years on from that, um, I joined McLaren to make models of the racing car. And that was very much a digital twin. The idea was that we wanted to understand how the car worked in order to make the car go faster. It wasn't, you know, simulators had existed and we built a simulator for a Formula One car, but the idea wasn't to train the driver. It was to make the car go faster. It was to understand more how the car behaved. Because if we understood how it behaved, we could then come up with some weird ideas that we didn't even know necessarily how to make, but we could try it. We could get the driver to drive and then see what, the, what he, it was always a he, I've got to say, um, said. Um, and, and often it was terrible, but often it was very promising. And it allowed us to innovate quicker because we weren't afraid of putting something that might fail in this racing simulator. And we also ran it live. You know, we would have a driver, and I'm sure they still do that today, a driver riding, driving on a, on a Friday practice, and we could do it live at the same time because we had sensors all over the car, you know, about 500 sensors beaming the data back. And as a result, our simulation were constantly improved and constantly tested against this data that was arriving. So that's a machine, a machine now, that's easy enough to make a digital twin of a machine. What about a human? Right? A, with celebrating Leonardo's death 500 years, he's, I'm a fan, I'm a big fan of Leonardo, and I think in this a, day and age, he would be a fan of digital twins, because the experimentation that it gives you, I think, would be amazing. Well, one of the things Frank mentioned earlier about the aortic valve was something I wanted to share with you. One of the... You know, there's so many things that Leonardo has done, but in terms of what he's done in health, he's learned it all via dissections and, and animal um, uh, organs and looking at how they work. And he was fascinated about the fact that the aortic valve and what you saw earlier in the pictures that, that, that Frank showed is that all these little vortices, because the aortic valve opens and shuts, but blood always flows in one direction. And he was very intrigued by that. So what he did is he put wax inside the heart of an ox. And when it solidified, he then made a model out of glass. You probably know a lot more about this, how he's done it. But what's really fascinating is he then poured water with grass seeds in it, and through the motion of the water, was able to see what happens in this aortic valve. Now, when you think about it, he built a twin of the heart, and he understood how it worked. Now, he'd never published that, but if, an amazing story is in 1968, two researchers, two engineers at Oxford, published a paper in Nature. And what's most amazing about that paper, it was about the functioning of the aortic valve. It had one reference, and that reference is of Leonardo. Leonardo da Vinci, 500 years before. Now, how amazing is that, right? It just shows that the power of a twin, it made him understand how it works, and he got it right. Now, why do we want to 
the digital twins of humans. Now, everywhere around the world, people care about their health. And we all want to age healthily. Now, we heard about what disease is. There's a lot of reasons why we'd want to be healthy. But when we think about it, is it currently on this planet, there's more people with a mobile phone than there are people with access to primary care in health. That's amazing. But we have the power of phones. We can start bringing access to care to people via technology that they hold in their pocket. Now, that, that's a lot, you know, that's a lot to think about. But, and that's one of the missions of the company that I'm, I'm working for now, is to bring affordable and accessible healthcare to everybody on the planet. And to do this, we have to harness the work that a lot of other people are doing. And as we heard tonight from Rabia, there's so much happening. There's so much happening worldwide on this. The idea is these days, we don't have to cut uh, you know, a cadaver to learn about how the human works. There's a lot of data that we can get from a human that is alive, which is fantastic. But we now can do it not only at, at the sort of organ, you know, bones or, or tissue structure, we do it at cellular level and at, at that molecular level. All this that you heard about today is unbelievably powerful. We're getting so much data that we can then build models from. And people like Rabia and people here at Merck and people in universities around the world are building more and more interesting models, either to model how a progression of a disease or a healthy tissue, how they react to, to different you know, um, uh, circumstances of how they're used or how they, they grow. And, and all of this, if we start putting this together, we're starting to build components, at least, of a digital twin, of a, of a human. We're bringing it at a body together and we can, you know, we can do it at a macro level. But my point is that you don't need to bring all of this together to start having some use. We can do baby steps and have use for a digital twin. One of the things I found amazing um, about the UK Biobank studies they've done on the genomic side was I heard recently of a paper being published in the US. So this was you know, a big cohort in the UK, did, they, and they followed them for over many years. But the paper was about a cohort in the US, similar type of ancestry. And what they did with the, with the genomic data that they got is they were able to predict to two centimeter the height of everybody in, in that cohort, just based on the fact that they, of what they had found out on the biobank. Now, you think, yeah, just height, but that's the beginning. And that had never been done before. And that's a lot of it is in our genetic makeup. Our height can be, can be you know, estimated to two centimeters. That's phenomenal. Imagine you know, what more useful things that we can find out. But of course, it's not just about that. You know, that's nature, but there is so much that we are influenced with external factor. And that's another thing that's progressed enormously, is find out what is it that influences us. And one of the key things that we know about how we want to try to help people manage their health through an app is that the environment that they're in and their beliefs is enormously related to whether or not you're gonna do something. We all do things that are not very good for our health. And why are we doing it? Sometimes we're doing it because of social pressure, sometimes we do it just because we like it. I like having a drink, and or the drinking is not very good for my health. But I know, I'm saying I know this, but I might be doing something that's much worse. I might smoke for many, many years because I know one person that has smoked all their life and they live till 96. I convince myself that it's safe. It might be all right, it's not good for others, but for me it's okay because I'm like that person that I know. Now, there's a lot of beliefs like that that we have that unless we can connect our digital twin to those beliefs and those social exter and external functions that are there, we're not going to react to that, that digital twin. It needs to be something that nudges us, but in a way that we're in control. And that's the thing, I won't go here, but it's obviously a big element of ethics in, in there, because you know, if you know something a lot about someone, you could imagine a digital turn that become prescriptive rather than suggestive. And what I'm, what I'm saying is for it to be good for you, it has to be something that we're in control. If we're in control, 
that means that we're going to do, we're going to interrogate it and get the kind of information that we want to get out of it and not what is being given to you as a prescription because otherwise it won't work. So my prediction, therefore, is that actually I'm saying soon my digital twin, but we already do baby steps of digital twin, but it will get there. You know, if, if it's not something that it that rocks your boat, it will be for others because it will be your health companion. It needs to be something that, that we all, we use it to manage our, our, our mental and physical choices because in life, we need to make sure that the treatments that we have for what it is that we have is targeted to us for it to work well. We've just heard Rabia mention that very well. And knowing what is good for you is very difficult to do. Doctors around the world are really busy. It takes them a while to know what's the latest, and they're only humans, right? Whereas if we can augment their way of thinking by providing all that information, knowing which treatment is good for you, and you can interrogate the twin, then it's up to you. You can be in charge. And when you're in charge, you decide, you make those decisions, but it needs to be personalized to the way you want to live your life. Thank you.